Good evening. Welcome back to Tuesday Night Bible Study. Tonight's uh, lesson title is uh, Daniel Chapter 7, uh, A Survey of Five World Empires, Part 6. Hopefully in two more Tuesdays we'll finish this, and then I've got some really good stuff coming up on that, um, on Daniel Chapter 7. But let's, let's get straight into it tonight. First thing I want to do is start off by reading a verse to you. Uh, we're going to look at Isaiah chapter 49, verse 22. Now, I'm not pulling anything out of context. You can pull up Isaiah and read it, and it's talking about God returning his Jewish children or people home. So let's, let's go ahead and let me read verse 22. It's very important that I tie this in tonight. Verse 22, Isaiah 49, 22. Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will lift my, up my hand to the Gentiles and set up my standard to the people. And they, will, they shall bring thy sons in their arms and thy daughters shall be carried upon their shoulders. So what that verse is talking about is prophecy that we're seeing fulfilled today. God is returning his children home. And we know why. Uh, and, and I will get more involved in that probably here in the next little bit. But there's two main reasons God is going, is, is, well, one reason he's bringing his children home. He's going to show the house of Israel that he is God. And, of course, that's going to come in the time of the judgments. And we're going to be talking about uh, the time of Jacob's troubles tonight. I'm going to get into a little teaching on that. Before we do, I wanted to talk about a census. Now, I've always said for prophecy to be prophecy, for fulfillment to happen, there ha it has to be proven or disproven. So we know God has returned his children home. I've got a census here. I'm not going to spend but a minute on it, but I'm going to give you a little idea, and I'm sure you guys can Google it, and you can pull up a census on Israel. The year 1517, there was 300,000 people in, the, in Israel. 295,000 of them were non-Jews. 5,000 of them were Jews. Now, out of 100% of the Jewish people, that was 1.7%. Now, as you move up, and you can see at that time, there was only 1.7%. Now, let's move up to 1948, okay? In 1948, there was a total of population of 872,700 people. There were non-Jews, 156,000. In other words, Gentiles. Uh, Jewish people, there were 716,700. Out of the Jewish population, total population, excuse me, out of the total population, Jews and Gentiles, 81 or excuse me 82.1 percent were jews now let's move all the way to 2024 the right now is nine nine million nine hundred total people population in the jewish state non-jew non-jews or gentiles would be two million six hundred fifty three thousand jews Right now are seven million four hundred and twenty-seven thousand seventy-five percent of the Jewish state is Jews. It started in fifteen seventeen with a census of one point seven. This shows you God is bringing His people home, and He's using the Gentile nations to move them in there, just like He said He would right there in Isaiah chapter forty-nine verse twenty-two. Now. Let's get started. Let's get into the. And I know if anybody studies Bible prophecy that's online with me, or if anybody's ever heard, and I know they've probably heard people talking about a, a time of Jacob's troubles. Well, we actually get Jacob's trouble out of Jeremiah chapter 30. If you guys want to turn to chapter 30 of Jeremiah, we're go I'm going to break this chapter down. And we'll spend a few minutes on it. And we're going to talk about what is Jacob's troubles. Now, first of all, Jacob here is Israel. Now, how do we know that? How do we know this is Israel? A time of Jacob's trouble. Let me read verse 7 here. He says, Alas, for the day is great, so that none is like it. 
It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. Now, we know this is Israel because we know, and we'll break this chapter down, okay? And this is not the only place that talks about it. But Jacob's trouble, who's he talking about? All right. Who, first of all, who is Jacob? We know that's Abraham's grandson. We know that's Isaac's son. So if we move to Genesis chapter 32, you'll tell us right here. And I'm not going to go through the whole chapter. Um, you guys can actually mark this and go back and read it. I'm going to read two verses. Genesis chapter 32, let's look at verses 27 and 28. And he said unto him, What is thy name? In other words, this was, I believe this was God. A lot of people believe it's an angel, but God is the only one who has the power to change a man's name. So we know God, we know Jacob wrestled with God here. Okay, you go back and you can read it. We know that God touched his hip and throwed it out of place. Now, let me go on. And he says, What is thy name? And he, Jacob said, My name's Jacob. Verse 28, he said, Thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. For as the prince hast thy power with God and with men, and hast prevailed. So Jacob's name was changed to Israel by God. So that we know from studies, and, and like I said, remember, prophecy is a fine thread that runs from all the way from the Genesis all the way through Revelation. So we know that he's talking about Israel here because when we get into chapter 30 here, and like I said, I'm going to break it down. We're going to read it. I'm going to read a few verses, and then we're going to talk about them a little bit, and we'll continue on from there. I don't want to spend much time on it. But when we start out here, he's talking about prophecies of restoration, the regathering of Judah and Israel back to their homeland. We're going to know he's talking about the Great Tribulation here, and we're also going to know that he's talking about uh, the the Messiah's return, okay? So let's get started here. Verse 30, or excuse me, verse 1, chapter 30 of Jeremiah. The word came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, in other words, this word, Jeremiah's a prophet. He's the one, he's the one that's writing it down here. He is the, he's the scribe. And God is the one giving him the prophecy. God Almighty. How do we know? Verse 2. For thus speaketh the Lord God of Israel, saying, Write thee all the words that I have spoken unto you in a book. In other words, when I'm speaking this to you, it's very important. It's prophecy God's saying, and it's going to come fulfilled in the last days. And I want you to write it down, because I want my children... Israel to understand what's going to happen. Verse 3, For lo, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will bring again the captivity of my people Israel and Judah, saith the Lord, and I will cause them to return to the land that I gave to their fathers, and they shall possess it. So we know this is talking about God regathering his children and sending them home. Now, do a little study on it yourself, and plane loads of them, of the Jewish people, have, especially since 1948, when, when Israel become a nation again, they have been returning by the plane loads. God is pulling his children home, and there's reasons why. Just like I said a minute ago, he's going to prove to them he is God. Verse 4, and these are the words that the Lord spake concerning Israel and concerning Judah. Let's keep the Bible in context. He's talking about Israel and Judah. Judah is one of the, tri the 12 tribes of Israel. Okay. The line of the tribe of Judah is who Christ comes through. Okay. All right. Verse 5. For thus saith the Lord, we have heard a voice of trembling, of fear, and not of peace. Ask ye now, and see whether a man doeth travel with child. Wherefore do I see every man with his hands on his loins as a woman in travail, and all the faces are turned into paleness? All right, there's a couple of questions here that God asks. Then he answers, verse 7, he says, 
Alas, for the, that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble. In other words, Israel's trouble. But he shall be saved out of it. And we know that there's going to be 144,000 Jews that God's going to seal. He's going to take them. He's going to hide them in Petra during the Great Tribulation. After the first part of the Tribulation, the three and a half years, Antichrist is going to break his peace treaty. And we know for a through the scripture that we know that God is going to take and provide. He's going to, he's going to hide and he's going to protect 144,000 out of these 12 tribes. That's who he's talking about. Now, for it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord of hosts, that I will break his yoke from off thy neck, and I will burst thy bonds, and strangers shall no more serve themselves of him. Right now, guys, we're still fighting over that land over there. They're still fighting. There's still arguments over that land. What does this verse mean? Well, if God is going to, in that day, he is going to break the, the yoke of the Antichrist off of the Israelites, this 144,000, okay? Verse 9, But they shall serve the Lord their God and David their king, whom I will raise up unto them. This is a very important verse. At any time, how in the world is the Lord going to reign and David, their king, going to reign together? God, guys, this will be the millennial reign. This will be Christ is going to reign as king. David is going to reign as priest. Verse 10, Therefore fear thou not, O servant of Jacob, saith the Lord, neither be dismayed, O Israel, for lo, I will save thee from afar, and thy seed from the land of their captivity. And Jacob shall return, and shall be in rest, and be quiet, and none shall make him afraid. Right now, guys, they're still fearing over there. They're still fighting over the land. But there's going to come a day when they're not. And when Christ returns, he will settle that land dispute. I promise you. Verse 11, For I am with thee, saith the Lord, to save thee. Through I will make a full end of the nations, whether I have scattered thee. We know this is the battle of Armageddon. These nations of Egypt still there. All the nations that's persecuted him, Iran, still there. But there's going to come a day when God is going to make an end of these nations. But I will... But I will correct thee in measure, and I will not leave thee altogether unpunished. In other words, he says, I will not make a full end of thee, of Israel, in other words. But he's not going to leave them unpunished. And we know when we continue on with Scripture and we keep this in, we know why. So let's talk about this, okay? Like I said, the phrase Jacob's troubles. Now, let me break all this down, first of all. Jacob's trouble is going to be the last Three and a half years, the 2,620 days, it's going to be the last three and a half years of the Great Tribulation. These are going to be when the 21 judgments fall upon the world. Now, I know a lot of people say, well, why would the world have to pay for Israel? We don't. But it's going to be worldwide. And I'm going to answer them questions. I've got questions here that I'm going to ask and we're going to answer according to scripture, okay, when the time comes up. Why is it worldwide? I, the Bible tells us, and we will. hopefully I can answer that question through scripture for you guys. So we know it's going to correspond with the seven-year tribulation spoken of in the end times. It will, Jacob's troubles will be the last three and a half. Now, like I said, to keep the Bible in context here, we know the Lord's talking about the nation Israel and his children. Now, in these verses, God promises Jeremiah that he will return Judah and Israel back to their land that was promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But he also tells them but their return will involve many distresses. There's going to be problems. Verse 5 here describes Jacob's trouble as a time of great fear and trembling. 
Verse 6 here describes it in the terms of pains of childbirth and indicating a time of agony or birth pains. Now, let's tie that in with what Christ tells us in Matthew chapter 24, verse 19 through 22. So if you guys want to turn over to Matthew chapter 24, we're going to read 19 through 22. Christ even tells us here, he talks about birth pains. And we know there's three questions here asked. And I'm not going to stay in this chapter long because I have later on, I'm going to really break this chapter down. There's three questions here. And we know that Christ has, has pulled his disciples and they're sitting together and it's just his 12 and him. And there's three questions here that's asked. One of them is says, uh, of course, Christ tells him, you know, talks about the temple and this, that, and the other, and how beautiful it is, one of the disciples says. And Jesus says, See you not all these things, verily I say unto you, whom shall not one be left here, one stone upon another, that shall not be thrown down. That's verse 2. So we know he's talking about the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. But there's two other questions here that, that talks about end time events. And how do we know? Well, the first question he says, uh, he says, as they were sitting together, tell us when these things will be. All right, so that could definitely be talking about the temple. Absolutely, it could be. No question asked. All right, but the next two questions are very self-explanatory. And what, what shall the sign of thy coming, in other words, when are you going to return? Christ has told him he's leaving. He's going to prepare a place for him, and he's when where he's at, he's going to come back and get the church. And when is the end of the world? So we know this is the end of time. It has to be to keep the Bible in context. So let's let's go to verses nineteen and twenty-two. All right. And woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. And pray that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. So he's talking about birth pains. When you look up here, verses, when we start verses 5 through 15, he's talking about birth pains, stuff that's going to start happening that we can actually see today. Now he says right here, and he says right here, For then shall be great tribulation, as such as not since the beginning of the world, to this time no, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should be no flesh saved for the elect's sake. He's talking about Israel. Those days shall be shortened. So he's telling us here this is going to be a time like no other. He talks about birth pains here and how things are going to lead up to. And when a woman has birth pains, they start off usually easily. They get more extreme, more extreme, until she gives birth. Well, we know when when the ch when Christ gives, in other words, when the church gives birth, we know Christ returns for the church, in other words. So, Jeremiah 37 describes only a period of time that fits the description of the end time events. This time is unparalleled in history. It can't be no other time like it. And like I said again, we know God's going to pour his 21 judgments according to Revelation upon the world. He's going to pour it out on the heathen nations as well as Israel, the whole world. Now, we're going to, let's go ahead and look at a couple of verses on the tribulation period. And we're going to see why God is going to discipline Israel, okay? Why God is going to discipline Israel and bring them back to him. All right, now let's look at a couple of verses on that, and then we will tie the world into it. And like I said, I don't know if I'll have enough time to get all the way through this tonight or not, but I'm going to do my best to get as far as I can through this. If not, we'll pick back up on it next Tuesday. So let's go to uh, Jeremiah, back to Jeremiah 30, and let's move over to verses 22 through 24. Same chapter. Now, God tells us right here. This is why. Verse 22. And ye shall be my people, 
and I will be your God. Behold, the whirlwind of the Lord goeth forth with fury and continuing whirlwind, and it sh and shall fall with pain upon the head of the wicked. The fierce anger of the Lord shall not return until we have done it and until we have performed the intents of his heart in the latter days. Ye shall consider it. Now, we know he's talking about Israel here. We can't tie the world in here, but we will tie the whole world in. Let's go look at uh, Zechariah chapter 12, verses 8 through 11. And I want to read these. And this is also to keep it in context. We know the second, the burden of Israel with the siege of Jerusalem by the Antichrist is 1 through 3 here. Verses 4 through 7, or through 9, I'm sorry, is going to be the Messiah's second coming and Judah's part of Armageddon. Let's go on. Let's start with verse 8. In that day shall the Lord defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and he, shall, and he that is feeble among them at that day shall be as David, and the house of David shall be as God, and the angel of the Lord before them. And he shall come to pass in that day that... I will seek to destroy all nations that come against Israel or Jerusalem. We know again through Scripture, tying all this in, we know this is a battle of Armageddon. Now, listen to this, verse 10. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplications, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his holy son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is bitterness for his firstborn. Now, in that day there shall be a great mourning in Jerusalem, mourning as a mourning of Habadanam Remen in the valley of Megiddo. Now, what he's talking about with the mourning here of Habadanam had a Doremon. This was uh, where Josh, Joshua, Joshua, the king of Judah, was slain, and the great mourning was made for him. And you can read that in Second Chronicles chapter thirty-five. But anyway, here uh, he's saying right here that they're going to see him. He's going to burst the clouds, return them with the church, and they're going to see him, and they're going to mourn because they're going to realize that their forefathers, their forefathers had him killed. They're going to see all this. So again, that ties all that in. Now, I've got enough time, so let's move on. Let's answer a couple, of, let's ask a couple of questions here and we'll answer. So why does God pour out his wrath upon the world in the end times? This is a good question you might want to write down. And I'm getting ready to give you the answer according to Scripture. Why does God pour his wrath out upon the world in the end times? Why would God judge the whole world because of Israel's rebellion? That's two questions. And I'm, I'm sure if you if you've, have any uh, studies or part of eschatology, these questions would be asked to you. Well, I'm going to give you the answer according to Scripture right here. So it's not all about Israel. It's about a wicked world that has rebelled against God and a rebellious Jewish nation. Let me answer that question again. It's not about only Israel. It's about a wicked world and a, and a rebellious nation that's rebelled against God. Now, God gives us these answers, and I'm going to actually break them down for you right here. And let's, let's move on. Let's go back to uh, Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39. I'm going to give you the answer. There's two, an there's two reasons here. There's two main reasons that God's going to judge the world and Israel. Now, I'll give you the part on the, Israel's, and the nation of Israel a minute ago. Now, let's look at the world here, too. So, Ezekiel chapter 38, verse 23. Right here's one of the answers. Thus I will magnify myself and sanctify myself, and I will be known in the eyes of many nations, and they shall know that I am the Lord. So he's going to magnify and sanctify himself. 
to his people. And he, many nations are going to know that he is the Lord. Verse, let's move to 39, verse 7. I'll give you, right here, there's about five or six, he tells us five or six different times here. So I will, I will make my holy name known in the midst of my people Israel, and I will not let them pollute my holy name anymore, and the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, the Holy One of Israel. Again, the heathen nations are going to know, plus his people. Folks, there's, most of them still looking for him over there. His first coming. Let's move on. Let's move to... Uh, We've done seven. Let's move to verse 22. He says, So the house of Israel shall know that I am the Lord, their God, from, the, from that day forward. Verses 28 and 29 in the same chapter. So he says right here, Then shall they know that I am the Lord, their God. Verse 29, Neither will I hide my face anymore from them, for I have poured out my spirit Upon the house of Israel, saith the Lord God. So we know right here is the two reasons. Now, Christ also gives us this same answer in Matthew 24. So let's move back to Matthew 24. And guys, I know I'm a little winded tonight, but I'm going to try to finish this, uh, this out tonight. So let's move back to Matthew 24. Matthew 24, verse 37 through 39. He tells us right here. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee a hungered and first? And he tells us right here that he's going to judge the sheep and the goat nations right here, okay? this We know this is the judgment of the living nations of Christ's second advent. So you can actually read Matthew 24, or excuse me, I'm sorry. I'm in the wrong chapter, but that is part of it. Chapter 24, verses 37. I jumped over too far. I'm sorry. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days they were before the flood, they were drinking, eating, marrying, and giving marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. And knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also be the coming of the Son of Man be. It's going to be just like the time of Noah. They weren't expecting it. Well, guess what? People's not expecting it today. How do we know how the days of Noah was? Well, let's go to Genesis chapter 6, and we'll answer that question for you. Genesis chapter 6, verse 5. Give me just a second. I'm there. Genesis chapter 6, verse 5. And God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and it, that every imagination of the thoughts of the heart was only evil continually. Folks, we're getting there. We're getting there close. Each day we're getting there. So that's why God's going to judge the world as well as Israel. Now, I'm going to give you a brief synopsis of the rest of the book of Ezekiel, and I'm going to close out. Ezekiel chapter 40 is going to be Ezekiel's vision of the millennial temple. Why do Bible scholars believe that it's a new temple, and it's not the first or second one? Because the dimensions of this third temple is completely different from the first two. Ezekiel chapter 40 through 42, measuring the temple and the courtyard. Ezekiel chapter 43, the Lord's glory fills the temple after measuring the altar. Ezekiel chapter 44 through 47, we know this is going to be the ordinances of the temple. Uh, and of course, chapter 48, God's going to restore the divisions of the land of the Israel, to the 12 tribes of Israel during the millennial reign. Well, guys, that actually completes us on this. Uh, please join me next week. Tuesday night, I'm going to actually break down the ancient Galilean wedding and how we believe it foreshadows the biblical rapture, the marriage feast of the Lamb, and the second advent. And guys, there's so much here I want to share with you all. I'm very excited to share this with you all. Thank you guys 
for joining in tonight. I, I pray that everyone has a blessed and wonderful Tuesday night. Please like and share so God's word gets out. Good night, everyone.